Greetings, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Topic UFO. Tonight, we're going to be speaking with Mr. Zen Benefiel. Uh, he is a blogger and curator of ufologyprs.com website. Uh, I met uh, Zen via Facebook, and we got to talking, and I uh, thought he would make for an interesting guest on the show since he's had some experiences himself, as well as this uh, website I would like to uh, show you guys. So, uh, without further ado, uh, Zen, are you out there, sir? I am, and greetings, Earthlings. Yes, Zen, how are you, <laughs> how are you tonight? I'm doing well, Rick. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks for the time on the show. Great, great. Well, I'm glad you uh, were able to attend tonight. So, Zen... Um, you know, we first kind of met via this ufologyprss.com website, which is a very interesting website, and, and we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but then we started talking, and it, you've had some experiences in your life, I guess you would say. What, what got you started uh, in the subject of ufology? Well, I... I kind of got drug into it. I didn't necessarily look for things, my, or my curiosity to get, didn't get the best of me. Um, when I was five years old, I, I heard a voice call out to me one evening. A few years later, I'm uh, up in the corner of my bedroom watching my physical body get out of bed, climb out my bedroom window, walk across the neighbor's backyard, climb a fence, walk out into a 10-acre pasture, and rise up into an orange cigar-shaped cloud. And as soon as I would get to the perimeter of the cloud, my observer would become one with the participant. I'd go in the cloud, and I'd wake up in bed the next morning. Couldn't wait to go back. Now, from then, I, uh, you know, this happened probably... Um, couple of times a month for a couple of years, and I uh, would sometimes wake up with nosebleeds, didn't really think about it at the time. I just, after the experience, I couldn't wait to go back. Had, you know, very little recollection of what went on inside, other than it was just fun. Wow. So that's what, that's how it started. Well, now let's. I want to talk about this a little bit more. This sure. this, this cigar shaped, uh, I guess, craft. Uh, so you're you're in bed, and and you hear something. Is that what it was? And you look outside. No, no, no. Oh. I actually I would awaken. Awaken. Um, it's a, it's like an out of body experience. Okay, I would wake up in the corner, the upper corner of my bedroom, looking down on my physical body. Okay. And then I would watch my physical body do all those the rest of the stuff. And this, you were a little kid at this time. I was eight. And did you talk to anybody about this, or was this something? You no. Kept, it was an inside <laughs> inside job, huh? Yeah, yeah, no, I didn't talk to anyone. However, um, many years later, now this was just west of Muncie, Indiana, rural Indiana. And uh, when I was 23, many years later, uh, we were getting ready to move to Phoenix. And I was walking through a metaphysical bookstore in Muncie, and this book falls off the shelf in front of me. Nobody else around, okay? <laughs> this thing falls off on the floor, open, cover up. I walk over to it, and it's Strangers Among Us by Ruth Montgomery. And I pick the book up, I flip it over, and the first paragraph that my eyes are drawn to, paraphrased, uh, read something like, you know, the most common UFO contact the experience in the Midwest in the late 50s and early 60s was the orange cigar-shaped cloud. Oh, my God. You're kidding me. Yeah. So... Um, you know, what do you do with that? Uh, I, there was no one around me to go, Hey, well, you know, look what I found. Uh, well, my I life, to, my life now has meaning. <laughs> my God. Uh, yeah. There was many other things that happened in between that, uh, provided the meaning. So, uh, it was still, you know, quite, a, uh, an awakening 
in that moment. It, I, it's like a domino effect where things, a bunch of things all of a sudden made sense. Wow. That, that is just, that is bizarre. I, I don't think I've ever heard anything quite like that. Now, did these experiences, you know, you said there was a lot of things that happened in between, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but uh, did they continue as... Uh, to this day. You, you Till to this day, huh? Yes. Yeah, it's gotten more and more intricately involved in uh, communication-wise. Uh, the topic matter and material is much more involved with consciousness and creating a, a, a kind of gates in the thoughtmosphere, if you will, that allow a higher vibratory or a higher reasoning, a higher thinking. Um, you know, ultimately, I was led to the understanding that we're cosmic consciousness condensed into form that we call bodies, mm -hmm. and and we're becoming aware of the layers of how that happens. Wow. Now, these these experiences you have, uh, do you refer to them as abductions? Do you refer to them as meetings? How do you how do you describe them? I've never felt like I was abducted. It's always felt like family. Um, now I'm all I'm orphaned and adopted, so maybe there's something to that. Um, at the same time, I've never had a negative experience. I've had experiences that, had I not had the understanding or the prior um, awareness, it could have been. Um, I mean, I woke up on a steel gurney one night on board a ship with electrodes lining my sphincter, and I woke up laughing because it was kind of embarrassing. There were three... Uh, tall Zetas, the almond eyed taller ones that were up against the wall across the room from me. And I start pulling out the electrodes with, you know, come on, guys, what the heck are you doing? <laughs> um, and I got the, the last one and I felt a sting. And I opened my eyes up and I'm instantly back in my bed. Now, my first thought was, oh man. I want to go back, you know, because I was right there. I was not afraid by any stretch, but I, I was there. I was fully conscious. I was on board. They were in front of me, and I wanted to go back because I wanted to finish that conversation, whatever it was, or that experience. And so I went inside, tried to go back, not knowing how, and I run into this uh, humanoid-looking uh, male figure that simply says, you know, next time just relax. We're just trying to tune you up so we can communicate more easily. And, you know, through, that may sound kind of strange. Yeah, through your sphincter? Right. And the reason being, if you look at the science behind all of this, there's a nerve that ends in the sphincter that's a direct connect into the central nervous system. It's called the perineum. Mm -hmm. And I just so happen to have been studying the nervous system the, the previous week with my girlfriend at the time. She was studying to be a massage therapist. And so I was going over her anatomy class material with her. And that was one of the things that came up in our discussion. So from a scientific standpoint, if there was another race that was going to somehow um, semi-non-invasively, you know, plug in and work with us in order to adjust our own energy level or a vibratory rate, where would they do that? Well, the most obvious place, according to our physicality, would be in the sphincter. Well, maybe this, um, you know, tells a lot about the all the stories of the, the anal probes. Absolutely. I, I believe it does. Wow. I've never heard anything uh, like that, Zen. That's, that's amazing. Uh you know, I'm just curious on what your personal thoughts are. Uh, you know, I don't know, maybe it's a 50-50 split when you talk to people that have been abducted or, or say they have. Um, 
you know, 50% say it was a good experience, 50% say it was not. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you think, are there any particular reasons why somebody would feel it's not a good, is it fear? Oh, absolutely. Or... Absolutely, because they're not prepared. You know, you get thrust into a situation like that where, in reality, they turn the fear into uh, an anesthetic mm -hmm. for your body and they paralyze you so that you won't hurt yourself or them. So in that kind of experience where you're thrust into an environment that you have absolutely no awareness, clue, even though you may have thought, wow, this, this would be really cool, when you're in that place, you're in a completely different environment that is totally unfamiliar and most people will fear, feel fearful mm -hmm. in that kind of uh, situation, and rightfully so. And it's a, a total loss of, of control as well, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Now, I personally feel that there is a deeper um, connectivity, if you will, from a consciousness level as far as the timing of these conversations and the or these abductions or whatever you want to call them um, these um, visitations okay there is something more at a deeper level of consciousness that's going on on a timeline that has more to do with the um, the advent or, or the type of contact and the actual occurrence of it than most of us are aware of, because in, in the non-linear, non-local space, uh, there's a lot more going on than we can even begin to imagine at this point in our own evolution. So, and, and I don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole, but... Yeah, we only got a half hour, dude. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> we could sit here and, and talk about this for hours, but... right. The, the age-old question, uh, why are we here? Uh, have you been provided some insight into that question uh, through these, these uh, meetings? Yes. And simply put, we're here to learn how to get along with each other. That's the bottom line. And, and how do they think we're doing overall? Probably not very good, huh? Well, you know, look at the progression of a planetary civilization, if you will. And it starts off with little pockets of uh, communities here and there, and they eventually grow to the point where their uh, boundaries come up against each other and you're having to deal with other people that you haven't so far and you don't know what their cultural um, stigmas are or, or how they communicate, what language they use, uh, what color of skin they have. You know, there's all of these outer things that tend to put up boundaries and barriers to entry, if you will, um, that are part of the process. And learning to look beyond that and understand that we're all searching for home on this ocean of emotion, if you will, and, and guiding our relationships to shore. Um, and, you know, when you see things from that perspective, the longevity of the time frame that it takes for that to take place on a planetary scale puts things in more of a perspective. So, yes, we're still pretty barbaric, but we're, we're coming along. We're finally getting to the point where we're recognizing the natural rhythms and cycles both of our own physical nature, our biophysical nature, and of the planet. So as we begin to understand these uh, in more of a both scientific and spiritual fashion, the two of them begin to blend more, and we have more uh, capacity for anthropic evolution, human-friendly. Interesting. Interesting. So, tell us a little bit about your book. Zendor the Contrarian. Zendor. Well, that uh, by the title, it, it might give you an indication. My views are kind of contrary 
to most. I, I've been through a lot of different religions. I've been through um, various schools of thought, disciplines, and found that there is more beyond them. They're a framework from which to you know, move through. And as you can tell by some of the things that we've talked about already this evening, um, my direct experience gives me the opportunity to look at things from a little different perspective. That's Sam, by the way. Oh. He's, uh, <laughs> he's decided to join us. Um, he adopted us uh, about a year ago. Yes, I, I have two of them myself, so I, I understand. Yeah, he's got to get into the picture. He's my cosmic kitty. When he first showed up, uh, he was sitting at the back door, and I opened it up, and he ran in. And uh, for several days after that, he would climb up on my stomach as I was laying down, and he would need my solar plexus. And just feeling the change in how I felt during that process and the change of my own energy was uh, – pretty healing at that time so anyway back to Zendor the Contrarian um, the book itself starts it's kind of an autobiography uh, and it includes a lot of my personal thoughts and exploration and study uh, into the various experiences and questions that came from them you know we questions are only as good as what we can ask and the depth of which we ask from and the, uh, the intelligence that we have in asking those questions. Every question has an answer, you know, are we asking the right ones? And now is this book, uh, probe into the whole UFO ET phenomenon or is this it does completely different. It, it does. It, no, it, it it spans the gamut between, um, well, as you, the the subheading of it is a seminal view into consciousness, cosmology, and uh, the congruence of science and spirituality. Mm. So, um, I want to talk a little bit, if we could, uh, about your, your website as well, uh, ufologyprss.com. How did this all come about? And uh, tell, us, tell us how you put that together. Well, I was at a business mixer, and uh, I met the folks that created the, the wireframe. It's actually a technology that's designed for the next level of digital publishing. So you can take any topic and plug it into this type of wireframe or curation or aggregate, I think is the more common term. So in talking with them, um, I got what they were doing and I was excited. So we discussed a little bit further and came up with the ufology press because I was getting ready to go to the International UFO Congress. And so we put this together. I went out and I researched the RSS feed, which is really simple syndication for those of you uh, that don't know what that means. And the P before that means personalized. So you can actually personalize your own particular page by using the features of our website. And we've got oh, probably about 120 RSS feeds that are uh, – mostly ufology related and things that are on, you know, that spill out from that topic area. Uh, we've gotten to the point now where we just had our 10,000th visit uh, since last February. We are about 50% return visitors as well, you know, and 50% new visitors, which is a really great uh, statistic to have and our average visit is uh, almost three minutes long i think excellent and and so what's neat about this website um rather than having to to go search for a bunch of things uh visit numerous websites you can personalize this page to your own liking as far as the information that comes in and it is constantly updated uh per your preferences, right? Well, the, the there's 120-ish RSS feeds 
that come into this website. So we've gone out and we've scoured the web and we've found what we thought were the best and plugged them into this aggregator. And so any time there is a new post by any one of those bloggers, videographers, YouTube channels, Vimeo channels, any of those kinds of things, it shows up immediately. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. I mean, just a, a super use of, of technology. Um, I would definitely uh, suggest uh, anyone into ufology, go check out this site because uh, it, it's a fantastic idea and it uh, works very well from, from what I've uh, seen and used from it. So. And it allows me to help support others, you know, radio stations, shows, exactly, uh, authors, uh, various things. It's advertising rich. You know, we're attempting the the goal is to make this or to demonstrate that this is actually a new business model, mm -hmm. so that it actually supports itself, and that in every uh, locale, let's say whether you're in Los Angeles or Chicago or New York, that you can actually designate. Uh, the advertising for that geographic area. Okay. So it's kind of like a franchise. I see. So that allows, you know, a bookstore owner or a promoter or somebody in that area that really likes what we're doing and wants to not only uh, sell advertising for themselves, but use what we put together in order to be able to do so. Excellent. Excellent. Well, it's a beautiful website, uh, really looks nice, and uh, the, the information, uh, the way that it, it comes to you. You know, it used to be people would, would build portals uh, where basically you, you went to this portal and then you had to go out to these other places. Here, the information is brought to you, which is, which is right. very convenient and very, very nice. Plus, like, well, and like I said before, it, it's, the, it's the new level of digital publishing. So I see also that, uh, that you do workshops on uh, self-awareness. I do. What, uh, what can you tell us about that, Zen? Well, uh, you know, with this, with the things I've been able to experience, the research, the study, uh, I've been, uh, I've got two master's degrees in business as well. Uh, I've been involved with corporate training. Uh, I was a president elect for the American Society for Training and Development chapter uh, here. Uh, so, not only what I find in other workshops is that, you know, there's a lot of sages on stage, and that's great. You know, there's a lot of information to share. My workshops differ in that I provide a direct experience for the people to actually enjoy and experience what it is that we're talking about as far as the levels of consciousness, going into meditations, having um, experiences of, of how to use their minds, their hearts um, in ways that they know they've been capable of but haven't necessarily uh, been instructed in the particulars of how. I've been very fortunate in that since I, these things started with me at a very young age that I was able to monitor and, and not necessarily monetize, but <laughs> um, in some ways, I suppose. But to be able to utilize that understanding in order to, um, you know, extend a hand and, and share um, what I found out so that others can benefit from that. Yeah, I think that would make for a uh, a very unique training session to to have a trainer that has had those types of experience. Um, it, you know, something you couldn't get from uh, a trainer that just went by the book, so to say. Right. It's like going out and and getting a coaching mm -hmm. certificate and calling yourself a coach without having the life experience to back it up. Exactly. Um, what I've also been able to do, which has been really fun for me, I'm a drummer, and I've been able to help produce some music that literally can take you out of this world. And so, one of the or several of the things we do actually is utilize 
some of the music I've recorded to help people move into those um, interior spaces. You know, I, I, I find it interesting that you brought up the whole music thing. Uh, I, too, have been a musician from a, a very early age, you know, from school band and uh, mm -hmm. rock and roll bands and, and all of that. Played snare drum in the sixth grade. <laughs> I, played, I played clarinet, so I was the geek, you know, in front of you. Um, but, uh, you know, the whole thing with music, and I think creativity overall uh i think there is some type of connection uh oh, between absolutely. creativity and and these these rogue frequencies that don't really come around during day-to-day -day type things well, there, you know what i'm saying absolutely there's a couple of things that come to mind specifically the first is a very academically related um piece that music, when you are engaged in that, your science and math scores go up across the board. Yeah. It, it's proven. Okay. Now, this, the other thing is a little beyond that, into the tones and frequencies. Um, the Hindus call the sound current the uh, Shabda, which is san Sanskrit for uh, sound. Mm -hmm. And in this place, when you are really quiet, you hear a high-pitched tone. And oftentimes, this is the same type of experience that happens with contactees. It'll start out as a very high-pitched tone and gradually descend in pitch to where you feel like you're totally engulfed by this pulsing hum. Wow. And, and is that for some type of relaxation technique or something? or? Well, I believe that it's a... A communication uh, link? Th or? These, these things are, are much more connected than what we may realize. They're more organic mm -hmm. in nature. And that bio pulse, it's like the pulse of the, the universe. It's echoed and, and mimicked, uh, by mimicry, if you will, in our heartbeat. You know, every heartbeat that we have, we expand and contract, or we explode and condense with each one. And it happens at such a rapid rate that we aren't intellectually conscious of it, but energetically, this is what happens. And, and if you have the right diagnostic <laughs> equipment, you can actually see this happening. You yeah. know, the... the so those kinds of things, this pulse, when you are in that experience and you're able to hear things at that level, it seems to permeate the basic foundation of the entire experience when you can get quiet enough to hear it. Oftentimes, our minds are racing because we've got so many thoughts and so many questions of our of the experience that we're in and trying to figure out what the heck's going on that we are unable uh, to actually hear um we're too busy mm -hmm. to be quiet enough to listen and to ask a question and shut up you know what well, and well, wait I, i'm sorry uh no i was going to ask you um haven't they done studies, uh, you know, uh, um, around like music that is produced in four four time? There, there's a certain something about music that's produced in four four time. Uh, that yes, you know, there's been many studies, and I can't name them specifically. But yes, the music rhythms, patterns, tones, frequencies, um, they all have an effect on our physicality. I, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. Well, listen, Zen, we've we'll reached the end of our, our time here. Uh, and it goes by so quick. It, it does. It really does. 
Uh, but uh, of course, you're you're always welcome to to come back uh, anytime. I want to uh, give a shout out for the website again, and uh, I'll pull this up on the screen. Uh, it's ufologyprss.com, where Zen is a blogger and is the curator. And uh, the name of the book is Zendor the Contrarian. And where can that be uh, uh, purchased, uh, Zen? Well, you can go to Amazon, mm -hmm. uh, Create Space. I mean, that's where I published it through, but it's on Amazon. Uh, it's not available as a Kindle version because it's quite a large book. Um, there are shorter sections. I actually published three different uh, books that I then compiled into that one. The shorter series is called Zendor the Barbarian. <laughs> it's, you know, I, I kind of tend to stir stuff up. Um, <laughs> but that can all be uh, purchased through my website at uh, bethedream.com, oh, okay. which also has information on the workshops, uh, the books, the tapes, uh, I'm sorry, the CDs that uh, I produced uh, as meditations and also from the musical interludes of my life. Oh, excellent, excellent. I'll have to check that out. Well, listen, it's, uh, it's a, been a very uh, educational and insightful conversation. I've enjoyed uh, talking with you, Zan. Oh, good. I, I hope that your viewers and your listeners were able to benefit from it. And by all means, if uh, you have any questions or um, you know, have a story to share and just need an ear, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, I'm available. I'm pretty transparent, and I don't hide. All right. Very good. Uh, I'm sure you probably get some uh, someone, if not a few, take you up on that, Zan. Good. All right, Zan. Well, listen, thanks again, and uh, we will stay in touch as always. And, uh, you know, stay safe and, and keep doing what you're doing. Thanks, Rick, and you too. And thanks again for having me on. And uh, best wishes to the continued success of your show. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right. Good night, Zen. Good night, Rick. Bye-bye. Uh, Answer is to keep it.